so um, glad that everyone's here in person on online. And we may start doing like, I heard mom saying it, or Linda, as you know her, dad, John, Lauren. I heard a lot of people say, we need to do a greeting after worship before um, before the word. I think we need to start doing that. And so, and if you're online, you can just chat more. You can just say hi and do some chatting. Um, but we're glad to have everybody on here with us. Um, we have been we've been going through a series called Cultivate to Harvest, right? And we've been weeding out of our hearts all these different things that could keep us from having a good uh, harvest in our souls, right? So that's what we've been doing. We've done um, the first time, first message of the, of the series was the parable of the four soils. And then we did, uh, um, almost forgot, unforgiveness and disappointment. And then we did fear and insecurity last week. This week we're going to do something that's going to sound different, so I'm going to have to explain it, but it'll be clear as we keep going. But we're going to do today, we're going to do the weed of casual confidence. You may be like, what do you mean casual confidence? (laughs) All right. Um, This is what I mean. Casual confidence in the Lord God. That's the weed we want to pull out, is any kind of casual confidence. We want to make sure there's strong, clear confidence in who the Lord is. Um, And we need deliverance, actually, from this weed of casual confidence. And we need to come into a robust, fully leaning, nothing lacking confidence in who he is, what he says he will do, and who we are called to be, right? Yeah, so we need need to get this out. And if we don't, when we come to him in prayer, and when we come to him as his children, if we don't really believe him, like really believe he's going to help us, then we can be sure that we aren't experiencing what it feels like to fully follow him. Because when you fully follow Jesus, when you go before him, you throw all of your confidence, all of who you are, into who he is. And you believe that he's going to answer your prayer. And so there's this kind of casual confidence that has crept into the Western church. And it is not of the Lord. It is not of the Lord. We lean on our possessions. We lean on our own intellect. We lean on um, our own government. We lean on who we are as a culture. And that is not of the Lord. You can have good things in your life that don't have anything to do with maybe what you would think is faith. Like, you can have a great work ethic. You can do all these things. You need to. But what I'm saying is your confidence and my confidence has to be in the Lord completely. He needs to be the first person we go to. The middle person, the last person, he needs to be the person we consult before we do anything. And we need to believe that if he opens a door, and it's really him, we can go through it in confidence. If he closes a door and he really closes it, walk away from that one because he has something else for us. So we need to let that weed get pulled out this morning so that we can really, um, you know, live out our calling in the Lord. So in order to spot this weed and get clarity on it and what real confidence in God looks like, we're going to take a look at a few of our fathers of our faith, and we're going to look a little more specifically at the end at Abraham and his faith and how that relates to our faith in Jesus himself. Okay, so we're going to relate this. And so even though Abraham is the first chronologically of the fathers of our faith, we're going to actually look at him last when we focus in on Jesus. <clears throat> the first example, though, that I want to direct us to in combating casual confidence in the Lord is Moses. Okay, just real quick so you'll know a lay of the land. We're going to talk about Moses, David, Abraham, and of course our Lord Jesus. Um, but I didn't know, Stewie didn't know I was preaching on that. He didn't know who was going to be featured in this, and he chose the song Same God. You know, he talks about I'm leaning on the God of Jacob, God of Moses, God of David, right? Um, and so it's just neat how the Lord puts things together for us to really focus in on him. But I want to talk about Moses for just a second. We know Moses, he's, he's such a famous person and a father of our faith, one of the fathers of our faith. Um, and he had what I would say is a rise and a fall and a fall and a rise. He had these big 
things that happened in the arc of his life. And so he rises to be in Pharaoh's home, right? Because he's this little baby that gets hidden in a, in a basket and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and adopts him, right? So he's, even as being in slavery, as Israelites in slavery, he still comes up in the house of the king, really, as you could say. Um, but I want to tell you all something. The other day I was looking, Natalie has this book called um, Little, or Bible Stories for Little Hands, or something like that. And um, as we were going through the book, she was pointing out, and every time we came to a baby, she'd say, baby Jesus, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. So even when we were at the Moses part, she looked at him in the bulrush basket and said, baby Jesus. And I thought, actually, that's a really powerful connection. And it's prophetic because Moses was really prophesying Jesus in that basket. You may say, why? Well, because Jesus was, was he in a nice you know, homemade bed somewhere in someone's home. No, he was in a manger. He was just kind of in a makeshift situation, and he had to be hidden so he wouldn't be killed later, you know, when they, they killed all boys to and under when Herod was looking. So I, anyways, I just saw, I was like, yeah, that is, he is like baby Jesus there. And then she pointed when we got to Noah, Jesus. Then we pointed to the next guy, uh, Jonah, Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, there's faces of Jesus in every single one of these stories because in the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And that if you can put a bow on all of that in the name of Jesus. And so I thought that was really neat that she like looked at Moses and saw Jesus, even her, her innocence. But here we are at Moses. But he, he goes into the house of Pharaoh and he's in this rise. He's got everything he needs. He's got education. He's got what his fellow Hebrews, fellow Israelites do not have. So he looks at them and he's like, that, they are my people. Those are my people, not, not Pharaoh's house. Um, and so we know what happens. He, he has this justice rise up in him. And when he sees um, an Egyptian uh, person beating a Hebrew slave, his people... He kills that guy, right? So was that a good choice? No. But that would be where we come to the fall. But the justice in him was for his people and for the house of the Lord. And so it was a bad choice in that it made him exiled for a little bit. That's what I mean. And so he had justice. He was fighting for his people, but he was exiled. So that's the fall. But then while he's out there in the fall part, you know what happens? He rises again through the burning bush. And so that burning bush brings him back into that full rise that he never comes out of. He never comes out of rising at that point because he encounters God and he says yes to the call of what God wants him to do. And he actually becomes an unparalleled companion of the Lord. And he has unparalleled leadership from the Lord. But this is, why am I talking about Moses? I'm telling you about him because you need to understand he wasn't doing this out of his own Uh, riches out of his own resources. What was coming out of Moses was a confidence in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who he was putting his faith in, not in his own ability, not even in his calling. And in fact, he was like, wait, are you sure you got the right guy for the job? I don't feel like I can speak. But God's like, no, I know who I chose for this. And I want you. And he wants to use us. Even when we're like, are you sure? He's like, I'm sure. Don't question him. You may question him, but if you'll question him with reverential awe and fear, you'll get somewhere with God. Because he'll take you where, if you question him in the right way, he'll take you where he wants to take you. But anyways, Moses maintained confidence at every turn. So when he goes back to his people to pull them out of slavery, he goes back at every turn with confidence Every plague, he has confidence. In who? God. He did not have a casual, shaky confidence. He wasn't like, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll just go back to Midian and go back to sheep herding and all this. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He was like, I encountered God. He spoke to me out of a burning bush. A bush that's burning but not consumed is what we should look like when we have the Holy Spirit in us. We need to look like a burning bush where people are like, whoa, she's, he's burning, 
but they're not consumed. Yeah, because you're on fire with the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to be. But anyways, he, that's how he knew he, who he was following was a God of his ancestors. And so this didn't mean Moses didn't make, sin or make mistakes. We know he did along the way. But his most constant lifestyle was full confidence in God full crap collaboration with God and closeness with God. And so the circumstances that I think highlights one of the greatest biblical examples of having your confidence in God is found in the Red Sea miracle. So we have the people of Israel coming out of slavery. The sea is in front of them. The Egyptian army is behind them. Casual confidence cannot be here. You don't have a choice. So if you turn around, you're going back to not just slavery, you're going back to death. Because I don't think the, the, Pharaoh was going to make things horrible for them. It was already horrible. Can you imagine him increasing that? No, you can't go back. That's certain death. And in front of you is the sea. What are you going to do? Well, God is speaking to you through this guy, Moses. You're going to have to go forward. <laughs> You're going to have to go forward with confidence. And so what did they do? They did it. They stepped forward in confidence, and they stepped onto dry land. I want to read to us a bit of their praise that they had, that that Moses led, Miriam, his sister, led into this praise, and the Israelites were just praising God for setting them free. And it's in Exodus 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13 to us. But this is what it says. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army he has hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters gushed over them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those who rise against you. You unleash your blazing fury. It consumes them like straw. At the blast of your breath, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood straight like a wall. In the heart of the sea, the deep waters became hard. The enemy boasted, I will chase them and catch up with them. I will plunder them and consume them. I will flash my sword. My powerful hand will destroy them. But... You blew with your breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders? You raised your right hand, and the earth swallowed our enemies. With your unfailing love, you lead the people you have redeemed. In your might, you guide them to your sacred home. Amen. So why did I highlight that part? Because they said that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That means that when you have an issue and you need somebody to fight for you, you ask the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through his son Jesus to go out before you. And guess what? He is a man of war, meaning he's been warring a long time. And he sees the enemy where you don't see him. And he sees where he's coming and where he's going. And he's going before you. So when you need confidence, you better have it fully in the Lord because he's the one that's worthy of our full confidence. He's not worthy of a, maybe today I'll come have confidence. Maybe tomorrow, I don't know. No, he's Jesus. And if you're going to follow him, you're going to have to follow him come hell or high water through it all. And guess what? He said, I won't let the waters overtake you in Isaiah. I won't let the fire burn you. How many times? Now, we may go through hard things, and it feels like we got burned. It feels like the waters came, but you're still kicking. You're alive and kicking. So guess what? You still have a chance. He's still confidently going before you. You just have to choose have to have confidence in him in he god did not have casual confidence in you or me what do i mean he made a plan through his perfect son he said i'm not going to casually take care of these people i created i'm going to fully take care of them and send my son in human flesh to redeem humanity he didn't have con- casual confidence he doesn't deserve to have it back he gave his all and so this idea That God does not hear or does not see is a lie from hell. It's a lie from darkness. Shake ourselves awake. 
We need to know who our God is. And if we don't know yet, get to know who he is through his word. Please read the Old Testament along with any New Testament readings you're doing. (laughs) They go together. They cannot be separated. I tell Andy Stanley and whoever else wants to say this, we cannot unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament as he said. Sorry, sir, you're incorrect on that. We will not unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. It's the beautiful story of our God from cover to cover, and it all matters. Hallelujah. And let me tell you right now, as Israel goes to war, what, what are they singing? They're singing the Psalms. They're singing the Shema. They're singing, God help us, because they don't know what to do except for to trust in God. And we are going to continue to pray for everyone involved in that. But I'm just telling you, the same Israel that was here is the one there. And that's why they sing like that. They're singing the songs of deliverance, like Exodus. And that doesn't mean that any nation state is perfect in our time. But when have we ever been perfect? God cares about righteousness. And he will deliver people who have been attacked and people who have been put in slavery. And I'm not talking about Israel. I'm talking about then. Here they were in slavery and came out. We have our own story of how people came out in our nation and all over the world. Because God hates oppression and he hates injustice and he hates sin. And he really hates when people start to come up against his name because he's like, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. You don't know who you're talking about. I'm the God of Israel is what he's saying. And he's like, and when you mess with my people, you're messing with him. Did you know he cares like that about us through Jesus? We're just, we are the wild olive branch. We're grafted in, so we're Israelites through Jesus. So he cares. So he's like, you're messing with my people? I'm going to come to your aid. And the Lord knows how to do it in our time, in 2023. He knows how to fight for us. Okay, so I want us to talk about David for a second. Here we have David. He's this faithful, humble shepherd. He's the anointed king. He's the mighty warrior. But here's his part where he really reminds us of not having casual confidence. So there's this nine-foot tall, literal giant, evil warrior, Goliath, bent on destroying Israel and humiliating. I want us to, to, to pick up on that. Humiliation is when you don't just want to hurt people. You want to make them pay while you're hurting them. And that's what the Philistines were doing. They wanted to humiliate Israel and their God. That's what they wanted to do. Okay. And we have David, this young man, not even able to serve in the army yet. He's not even old enough to serve in the army. And he hears that Goliath is taunting Israel. And I want us to read about David's confidence because it's going to be really clear. His confidence in God. This is his response to the situation that's facing his people. I want us to look at 1 Samuel, and again, I'll read it to you. Um, 1 Samuel 17, 32, starting in verse 32. Okay, and it says, this is David speaking, don't worry about this Philistine, he tells King Saul. Remember, he's not even old enough to serve in the army. (laughs) He's come to deliver lunch to his brothers that are serving in the army. And so he just walks out. And he's not walking out prideful in himself or confident in himself. He's walking out, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's like, okay, this is who I serve. What do we, what's the, what's the lay of the land here? (laughs) He's just like strong in the Lord and full of life. Okay, it's so awesome. And he says, okay, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go and fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. So he's been practicing war, this Goliath. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. I love how NKJV says it, this uncircumcised Philistine. (laughs) Woo! He's not of the covenant, and he's talking like this to our God. For he has defied 
the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul, Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David that you come at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give you, I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals in the whole world. will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword. From its sheath, David used it to kill him and cut off his head. So, Lord took care of it, didn't he? He fought the battle for him. So who's the star in this? story God it's not David we always are like make me like a David so I can slay uh, Goliath no make me like David that I have confidence in God to come down and slay my enemies and now you may be like whoa whoa are you saying like real people no come on it's 2023 I'm not talking about fighting real people you know we know Jesus right I mean so he's gonna go before you and slay whatever your enemy is right Now, if we find ourselves, God forbid, in a real war, by the way, happy Veterans Day. Yeah, that was yesterday. We honored Jennifer uh, Vendewich Mosley, our our, um, in-house veteran that we love. Happy Veterans Day to her. So if, if a fight actually comes to you, though, well, yeah, we have people that fought for us, right? And so we honor them today. And so if that's the case, yeah, you do a real fight. You know, if you have, by the way, this is, David's doing, he's cutting off a head back in ancient biblical times, right? Barbaric times, right? Well, people were doing that on October 7th to Israelis that were innocent. Okay. So that kind of ancient thing has been brought to the modern. Yeah. Israel needs to be fighting and winning. And we're praying they do. And we're praying for I have to say it because people would accuse me of not being equal and caring about other people. We pray for everybody that's innocent. (coughs) Gazans who are innocent. Absolutely. But my point is when you get something coming against you, you need God to fight it. Maybe it's fighting an old enemy. What's your old enemy? Is it something that you keep doing? Is it something somebody keeps doing to you? God can take a stone and knock that giant out right? He can do it. It's interesting that in the Exodus, the enemies sunk like lead, right, in the bottom of the ocean. Those terrible people keeping the Israelites in slavery, they went down to the bottom. David went down to the bottom. Wow, went down to the bottom. You know what? When the Lord takes your enemy out, he actually takes them out. He actually takes care of it. And that kind of harkens back to our first uh, message on unforgiveness. That's why we don't have to carry the unforgiveness. We can release it because he's actually the one taking care of things because he is loving and he is just and he is kind. And so 
on the battlefield of our lives, the Lord will fight for us. And I want us to hear that and know that. But this let's, you know, I love in verse 37, verse 45, verse 47, you just keep hearing him say, you've defied the Lord of heaven's armies. You've defied God. God is the one that's going to do it. He's the one that's going to take down your enemy, our enemy, Goliath. And so that is not casual confidence. That is full confidence. He had to have full confidence in the Lord and not in his own abilities. God honored his faith. God will honor your faith, right? And, you know, again, like that song said this morning, I may not be facing a Goliath, but I still have my own, I think it said mountains or my own, my own giants. There we go. Um, To go with the actual analogies, we have our own giants, but God can take them out by his power. Um, All right, now, This is just the beginning of the way we see David leaning on God's powerful arm for everything, for everything. Um, And the reason I told you we need to read the Old Testament, because we constantly constantly see David saying, God, should we go fight? God, how do we do this battle? God, how do I lead the people? Because he was a king and a warrior, right? And so... We need to learn how to pray like that. God, should I take this job? God, should I um, be in this relationship? God, should I do this hobby? God, should I make that investment? God, you know, that's how we, that's how we live when we're under God and his power. So David's a good example of that. But I just want us to know, even when David had really major sin, major sin, he asked the Lord to forgive him. Guess what? He was forgiven. And he was called a man after God's own heart. And so just get recentered in the Lord. David just would get recentered in the Lord and he would keep going after him. So I just want to read uh, three more verses um, from Psalm 24. This is something where David, he's writing the psalm most likely when the Ark of the Covenant, where, which is where God's presence was housed during that time, he was bringing it back from Obed-Edom. And so they finally, the Israelites are getting the presence of God back. And so this is what he says in these verses, 7 through 10. Let me find it here. Or do y'all have it there too? Psalm 24. Yeah, that one, that one. It says, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. And then it says, who is the king of glory? And it says, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, I would say mighty in battle, but this version says invincible in battle. And then it says, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. And I love that it says, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Again, why am I saying that? Full confidence. Full confidence, full confidence, not a little bit. He's the one who caused them to be able to get the ark back. And so David is just losing it in total praise and adoration of of what God has done for them. And again, he knows who the warrior is. It's the Lord. Okay, but that, that king of glory, again, he does not deserve, nor will he be okay with our casual confidence. It won't work. I mean, you can keep doing it, but your prayers will not have some of the answers that they could have if we would have full, total confidence. Okay, and then Abraham, last but certainly not least, the father of the faith, the father of many nations, the blueprint of faith. Abraham's the blueprint of our faith because he was justified by faith, right? Not by the laws. He preceded the law. So he's the blueprint of our faith believed God. He had had this relationship with God. I I, I just think he is so fascinating. I can't imagine having Yahweh Elohim come down in a dim night and cut a covenant with you and walk through it. Whoa, I I can't even, I can't even like think about like how powerful that would be because it's not even like, you know, it's so powerful when we think about Jesus coming in human flesh and being born, but I want you all to imagine like God, the Father, coming down and walking and he couldn't fully see him his dim and all that 
But wow, that is powerful. When God himself cut that covenant with Abraham, guess who else he cut the covenant with? Us. We're under the Abrahamic blessing, Abrahamic covenant. Furthermore, and most amazingly, we're now under the new covenant, Jesus. So we are in that new covenant that started all the way back with Abraham and was completed in this new covenant in Jesus. So, so Abraham, here he is. Abraham and Sarah, we know, were barren. They had no children. They were way past childbearing age. They were in their older years. They have no children, but then God says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of nations. I'm going to bless nations through you, and I'm going to do it through this child, one child that I'm going to give y'all, and Sarah's going to bear the child. Okay, Th- there's a whole message. I was praying and thinking about this morning, this message. There's a whole message just in you can't have somebody else carry your promise, you, the surrogacy of a promise. You can't have a surrogate to hold your promise. Hagar couldn't do that. It wasn't fair that that was put on Hagar when she had Ishmael. And by the way, everything in the Middle East, Isaac, Ishmael, boom, there it is. That's what we're dealing with right now. So, meaning, don't circumvent God's plan and try to get a surrogate to hold your promise. You bear, you are the one who's going to have to carry your promise and bear your promise. Sarah. So, point is, God was like, you're going to have this child, and he's going to be the promised heir of Abraham and Sarah, the one through whom the nations will be blessed. So Abraham did not have casual confidence in the Lord about it. To be be clear, Sarah actually was the one who said, hey, can we do it this way? Can you just go ahead and take care of it with Hagar because I'm tired of waiting. I don't think it's going to happen. Now, Sarah is still blessed because she came back into faith, right? I'm just saying, Abraham never said, oh, well, it won't happen. I mean, he went along with the plan. It kind of sounds like Adam and Eve a little bit, right? (laughs) How we continue to repeat history, humanity. We think we're always different than the one before. No, we're not. And if you want to be on the right side of history, when history's happening in your world, get on the right side of it. Do it now. Grab it. That's why we're going to hang, that's why we're going to hang hostage posters. God help them. In the, um, from the Israel, Israeli hostage. We're going to hang their posters right here. I got, we got them printed at Office Depot. We're going to say, hey, try to rip it down now. You want to rip down that poster? Okay, well, we're going to have cameras up too, so if you break the glass, Tallahassee, <laughs> help us. <laughs> PD, help us. At least help No, God forbid that. Why would we hang them up? For people to pray and to wake up. Yeah. It's not about you getting the latest iPhone. People are dying. People, I don't even know if all of them are alive anymore down in some of the tunnels. We got twin three-year-olds gone. We got a mom and her four and two-year-old gone. Hostages. We got to wake up, people. Yeah, we got to wake up. We got to pray. Pray for these people. But anyways, get on the right side of history. If history's being made, go ahead and find out where God is in it and get on the right side of it. And then since you're a referee, because we're referees as Christian, as Tony Evans says, still call out for righteousness everywhere okay so all that to say we have abraham we have sarah doing things that humanity does which is we mess up but abraham still believed he did not have a casual confidence in the lord especially in what we're about to read in genesis 22 and let me tell you something about casual confidence it's a weed of nothingness and it leads to barren faith It leads to a barren wasteland in our hearts. Confidence in what? You might as well just go serve mammon. Because Jesus said, look, I want you to count the cost before you follow me. He said, I want you to look at what you've got on your agenda and find out. You got God and you got mammon, which is just self, world, wealth, sin. So choose. Go ahead and choose because you're going to serve one of them. One of them is going to be your master. So let's choose God. Let's choose the one who loves us with an everlasting love. But all that to say, you know, the Lord cannot have this just nothingness weed of, I guess I'll believe you, maybe I won't. But he deserves our full confidence. We're going to read now. 
Genesis 22, 1 through 18. We're going to see, and this is our last big passage that we're reading. But um, anyways, I just want us to hear, why did I give you all that background of reminder about them, you know, being barren and God promising them a son? This is why. Okay. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. (laughs) Okay. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. Y'all see this? It's Jesus. And then, while he, car- he himself carried the fire and the knife, Abraham, and the, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh uh, Yireh. That would just say Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abram from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you've obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly, guys, we got to get this. You got to get what's happening here. And you got to like translate that into now. Okay. You really do. We really do. Okay. This is God speaking. He said, because you've obeyed me, not withheld your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars and the sky and the sand of the seashore, your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Amen. Can you all imagine this? Abraham had one shot one son. One shot, one son. You know who else had one shot and one son? God. He had one shot to rescue us. That's it. There wasn't anything hiding in a thicket. Jesus said, okay, okay, I'll do it. So he had, God the Father had one holy one of Israel. He had one perfect lamb that he could give. So Abraham and Jesus, look at this connection here. I want us to read uh, three, 17, 18, 19, yeah, three verses from Hebrews 11. I was going to read a little bit longer, but I just want to focus on these three verses real quick, because this is an amazing moment that we see. Um, Hebrews 11 and then verses 17 through 18, or 17 through 19, sorry. I almost had it right there. Okay. And this is, this is when they're doing the hall, um, hall of Fame for faith here. But this is uh, starting in verse 17. It says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, 
was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Here it is. I just really want, really want us to sit on this here. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. What does that mean? That meant that Abraham was going to do it. He was going to sacrifice his son. He was going to fully do it. Because he, w- he wasn't going to say, oh, well, I guess we'll have a second kid. No. No, no, no. People before TV and iPhones and technology and just leaning on themselves, they put their full confidence in God. I, he can't run down to the fertility clinic. He can't. He, this is it. This is the one, son. The one. And so Abram said, okay. I love God and I follow God, so I'm going to do what he said. I left the land of Ur. I left the land of my father's. I'm doing everything else he says. Now I'm just going to kill my son, sacrifice him. Why? Because he said, because if I do, it's okay. Yahweh will provide and raise him up from the dead. So if you ever want to talk to a Jewish friend about why Jesus is who he is, please go here. Go here. Say, so remember Abraham and Isaac? Oh, yeah. Sounds a lot like this story in the New Testament with Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus rose, right? So I just want to say, I want you to imagine that kind of faith. We, that is a different kind of faith. <laughs> Abraham's faith is a different kind of faith. This is a kind of faith that you don't necessarily see somebody on a huge stage, on a mega church stage, that person having. Maybe they do. You see it more like around the Heidi Bakers of the world, that her pastors somewhere in uh, Mozambique, no one knows her name, but they're raising people from the dead in the power of Jesus' name. That's that kind of faith, that kind of faith. And so Abraham's like, yeah, it's okay. He'll raise him up. If I, if I kill him, Jesus will, I mean, God will raise him up, raise him from the dead. That is a different kind of faith. Okay, God, let us have that kind of faith. So Abraham reasoned, if God doesn't spare Isaac, he'll just resurrect him. That is real confidence in God. There's nothing casual about that kind of faith and trust. Say, God is the same. One shot, one holy one of Israel, his son. He gives him up, but unlike Abraham and Isaac, he turns around to let him do it, to die. He says, okay, this is it. I have to do this. And Jesus does it. He lays his life down for humanity, the only sacrifice capable of, of atoning for our sins, it was the plan that they formed long before time existed. In the council, in the council of the Holy God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there was this council of, we'll send, we'll send us, we'll send Jesus into the world, and he will die for the sins of the world. Wow. Okay. So you cannot have that, that's not casual confidence, that is full confidence when Jesus resur- or when God resurrects Jesus. Okay, so these two stories are bookends of faith, Abraham and Jesus. Those are bookends of faith, of real confidence in God. So what won't, this is my question for you today, what won't God do for you? Right? What will he not? And I'm just echoing, really, the Apostle Paul's words. He says, hey, if he didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us, won't he freely give us all things? 832, Romans 832. If God be for me, who can be against me, God's for you. If you'll kiss the son and honor the son. I'm talking about Jesus. If you will bow before the son, there's nothing he'll withhold from you. In the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're getting towards the end of this, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see a harrowing picture of what it looks like for someone to wrestle with having full confidence in the father. In Luke 22, 41 through 44, this is what it says about Jesus. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, his disciples. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Take this suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He did that three times. 
But here in Luke's gospel, it says, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is where Jesus settled all confidence in the Father, is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Adam and Eve, they deemed God untrustworthy and surely had a casual confidence, at least in his command in the Garden of Eden, here in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus settles the matter of who is worthy of our confidence, our full trust, honor, and obedience. He settles it in the Garden, right? He redeems the Garden. And he says, well, here, Father, just like it talks about in the Bible, you've given me a body, sacrificing it for humanity. Hebrews is such a beautiful book of the Bible. Um, But Jesus must have recalled this psalm when he was preparing for his passion. Psalm 1610, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to see corruption. Or another way to say it, allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. He was saying, okay, God, okay, Father, we're going to do this. I'm going to do it. And I know that I'm not going to rot in the grave. That was his confidence. And he was God, right? We know that, the God man. But still, his confidence in God was, I'll go all the way. And I won't be afraid because you're going to raise me. That is powerful. That's like literally the, the highest level of confidence you can have. And he showed it confidence in the Father, but he also showed confidence in who he was. What he was saying is, I know I'm the Lamb of God, and I know that I have to go suffer this, but I'm going to come up a roaring lion, the Lion of Judah. He's going to come up this roaring lion. So he knew the resurrection was coming, and he faced the worst things for us. But then that third day, up and alive. And this is the most compelling reason that I can give us today to reject the weed of casual confidence in God within our hearts and to fall before the, lo- the Lord's throne in total trust, total confidence, and reverential awe of who he is. No more, no more casual confidence, full confidence, the confidence that Moses had in God, David had in God, Abram had in God, and that Jesus had in God, even though he was God. Let's follow in these footsteps of these men that just powerfully said, yeah, I'll lead these millions out of slavery. And then David, I'll take this giant down. Abraham, I'll sacrifice my son, not because of my own ability. I know who's coming for me. I know who's coming for me. The enemy wants to tell you he's coming for you. No, you turn right around and be like, wait, no, Jesus already came for me, and he's coming for me, and he'll come for me every time I call out his name. Every time I say, Jesus, he's there. He never left. He lives in you. He lives in you. I love that line in that movie, The of uh, uh, Risen. It's about Jesus' resurrection, and somebody asks one of the disciples, like, well, where is he? Where is Jesus? And, you know, many people have been saying, he's alive. And this, this one says, everywhere. <laughs> yes, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's, if somebody is hiding right now, afraid, in some desperate situation, he's there. He is there. If you're right here at Evergreen in a beautiful November cooled off day, he's here. He's everywhere we call upon the name of the Lord. He is there. When you're at home and you're like, I'm going to tear my hair out because of my kids. He's there. Madison, (laughs) she's a great mom and loves her kids. My point is, we all know how it feels. You feel like you're going to be like, ha. Sometimes I tell Sue, I'm going to go out on the porch and yell really loud and then come back in. I don't. Thank God, because the neighbors would be like, she's also running a church over there on Capitol Circle. Um, But, you know, he's there then. He's there when we're like, the smallest thing. If you're like, oh my goodness, I've got to get this thing in the post office, the mail today, and I don't know if I'm going to make it in time. I mean, something random like that. He's there. Just say, God help me. You care about me as much as you cared about these fathers of the faith. And I know you do because you sent Jesus. Smallest, smallest question, smallest need, all the way to something huge, like I need you to help my family. I need you to heal my body. I need you to take care of this. I need you to help our nation. 
think big, whatever your big prayer request is, he's there and, and he won't leave you. But you, what you can't do, you can only live like that if you have that full confidence. So we're going to pray today. We're going to ask God to deliver us all from its weed of casual confidence. I know I could benefit from that prayer. And really what it comes down to is do you fear the Lord or not? Do you fear his powerful presence in your life? And may he help us to do that. Um, And listen, you can pray wherever you're at. You can obviously also pray at the altar if you wish. You can walk around. You can stand up. You can lay down. Uh, before the Lord, I mean, literally any posture. But I want us to pray together and ask God to help us keep us from these kind of casual rabbit trails that Stewie was talking about and keep us from that and keep us focused in the strong confidence in God. So we're going to begin to pray together. Your prayer matters as much as your neighbor's prayer. So when you open your mouth to pray, this is with you and the Lord. That's one of the things that happened in the Protestant Reformation. The priesthood of all believers was found like a treasure. And so people realize, you know, I can pray to God through Jesus. And my prayers are heard as much as that priest that's praying or that pastor or that whatever they are. So let's just pray together. Father, we come before your throne in total confidence, in total confidence. You actually said that we should boldly approach the throne of God to find help in time of need to find the grace and the mercy that we need and and why did why are you asking us to do that today because your son paid it all so we can come right through into the holy of holies so right now father I'm going to set an atmosphere with your people by the power of your holy spirit now we invoke your presence we ask you now to touch us all Touch us, your people. We cry out to you with our voice, whether it's a whispered prayer or an out loud prayer. Right now, we begin to pray. You begin to pray, saints, in the way you need to pray with him. You lift your voice in the way you need to pray. And I'm going to pray over you, but I want you to get in your moment with Jesus. And you talk to him online. Saints, get in your moment with the Lord. And you cry out. Let your voice be heard. Don't be embarrassed. Our prayers matter. So, Father, right now we lift our voices. We cry out and say, let us have this strong confidence in you, Lord. We want the confidence that Moses had in you, the confidence that David had in you, the confidence that Abraham had in you, most of all the confidence that your son Jesus showed us to have in you. Jesus, you are our God. You are the Alpha and the Omega. We want to place our full confidence in you right now for whatever we need. But most of all, take your mighty hands, Jesus, and pull that weed. Pull those weeds of casual confidence out of our hearts, Lord. Take your hands and pull them out, Lord, so that there's no casual confidence left. And that's all that's left is a faith, even if it's the size of a, size of a mustard seed. That's it. We, Lord, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to be um, just, just to be exactly uh, like David yet or exactly like Moses. We just have, have that faith, that confidence in you that you're going to hear, the confidence that you're going to answer, the confidence that you're there for us, Lord. Just let us come into that understanding. Lord, like John the Baptist, you must increase but I must decrease. Our confidence in you must increase and our confidence in self must decrease until it's not there. So confidence in the Lord alone, the confidence in you to help us with our work, the confidence in you to help us with our spiritual lives, the confidence in you to help us with our health, the confidence in you to help us with our family relationships, the confidence confidence in you to, to help us to follow you and obey you and be your children. Father, we thank you that you are able to do mighty things. I pray, God, that you would fill your people with your Holy Spirit. Fill your people with your love. Fill your people with your joy. Fill your people with your peace. Fill your people with your self-control, Lord. Fill your people with your goodness. Fill your people with your faithfulness. Fill your people with all of the fruits of the Spirit, Lord. Fill us with you, Holy Spirit. Let the fruits be evident in our lives that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel, Lord. Let all of our confidence be put onto you, God. All the things that would hinder and pull us away from you, Lord, let them be silenced. Lord, let our eyes begin to look and gaze at you and better than we ever have, Lord. 
Let us gaze on you. Let us hear your heart for your people, God. We just pray, weed this thing out that it would keep us from full confidence in you, God. We just right now lay down self-reliance on your altar. Lord, we just say no. We will depend on the Lord. We will use the gifts you've given us, but we will depend on the Lord. Father, we pray you would flow through our lives in power. Flow through our lives in goodness, Lord. All the things that you have for your people, the church. Lord, I pray for dreams and visions for your people. I pray Pray for people who have never prayed in the Spirit to suddenly say, when I pray now, the language of the Spirit flows out. Wow. Lord, I pray for your people to be given a mighty anointing to pray for healing for people. I pray for your people to have endurance, Lord. That one's not as flashy, but God, we pray for endurance. Make us endure. Lord, make us faithful to persevere. Because if we have our heart on you, our heart set on you, our our full confidence we'll be able to endure we'll be able to persevere up that mountain like abraham up that mountain with everything hitting us in the face knowing what we're going to have to do up that mountain but lord when we get up on the mountain the, on the mountain the lord will provide it won't be us doing it it'll be you doing it because of our confidence in you god when we see the goliath in front of us let us take that stone of faith and say god will fight this battle You've defied God, and he'll do this. Lord, when people are saying things about us, they're not believing us. They're not believing who we are, Lord. Let that go down, that Goliath, in the name of Jesus. Lord, when we're like Moses, and we're leading people, and we're doing things, and Lord, we're like, oh, no, the army's behind the seas in front. God, let us say, I need a Red Sea miracle now, and God, let us watch those seas open up. Let us walk on that dry land over, because our confidence is in you, God, and then, Lord, like Jesus, when we're in the garden, and we're, we're in agony, saying, Jesus, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can obey this. I don't know how to do this. Lord, let us be like you that says, but you know, not my will. You your will be done. Not my will, your be will, your will be done. Three times, God, however long it takes us to settle at the altar, God. However long it takes us to settle our confidence in you, Lord. We want to persevere in prayer, God. The saints don't stay in prayer like they should. They get up and walk away after five minutes. We're going to rest in prayer here. We're going to sit with you, Lord, because that's what you've been asking for from the beginning. You've just been saying, can't you just come walk with me in the cool of the day so I can talk to you? Can't you just pray with me one hour like Jesus? He said, can you just pray with me one hour? So Lord, all you're wanting is just that full confidence, that heart connection, God. I pray it over your people. Let there just be a cry out of our hearts that God, you are the only God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who came in flesh, our Jesus, our Jesus. He's your Jesus, saints. He's yours. He loves you. He is your Savior. He's personal to you online and in person. He's your Jesus. Grab him. He loves you. He, he wants to speak to you and does speak to you so tenderly and specifically to you. So, Jesus, we just grab a hold of you. We grab the hem of your garment and just say, let us have full confidence in you. You're our only way out. You're our only hope. You're the only way for us. You're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. Jesus, you're everything we need. If we need to eat, you're the bread of life. If we need to live again, you're the resurrection and the life. If we need a way made, you're the door. You're the gateway. You're the great shepherd. Lord, if we need anything from you, if we need a drink of the well, you're the water of life. You're all of these things, Lord, and more. Oh, you're all of these things and more. You're every single thing we need. And Lord, I thank you that you meet us in our emotions. You meet us in our intellect. You meet us in every part of our being, mind, body, and spirit. And Lord, you love us. And so Lord, over your people, I just speak um, your confidence, your power, the power for you, all of us to walk in your confidence, to walk as your people following you, Lord. So wherever the cloud is by day, let us be there. Wherever the fire is by night, let us be there. So even when we feel like we're wandering, let us look for your spirit. Yes, thank you, Lord. When you feel like you're wandering, I want you to look for the spirit of God. And it, to the Israelites, it was 
a cloud by day and fire by night, but to you it's his word. To you it's prayer. To you it's he'll speak to you in a song. He'll speak to you on a walk. He'll speak to you wherever you go, wherever you lie down, wherever you wake up. So, Father, we put our confidence in you. We throw ourselves on the altar of need and say, God, you are our confidence. Here we are. We, we make ourselves available to you. We thank you that you can help us follow you, God. You can help us follow you. You love and care for the sin-sick soul. You will deliver from sin. Thank you, Jesus. You deliver from sin. We just say our hands are up. We surrender to you, Lord. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. And so, Lord, if anyone here needs physical healing, we pray the blood of Jesus to heal them now, to go into their bodies and do a mighty miracle healing. Lord, if there's anyone who needs salvation or rededication to you, Lord, send. You are Joshua, Yeshua, salvation. Send salvation to hearts online and in person that say, I need a renewal with Jesus. He's here to just touch your heart right now and to make everything right. He does it. If you need more filling with the Holy Spirit, just say, fill me, Jesus. Send that fire baptize, baptism on me. I'll take it. So, Lord, just fire baptize your people. If you need wisdom for an issue in your life right now, the, the all wisdom from the all-powerful God, may it come to you. Lord, let your people receive what they need. In Jesus' name, financial help, that mountain where the ram was provided in place of Isaac, that's your mountain to receive provision from the Lord, too. Thank you, Lord, for provision for your people as well, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, God. Keep our eyes focused on you, Lord. Away from the casual things like Pastor Sui talked about, and let us focus in on you, Jesus, full confidence. So, Lord, I bless your people today. I bless them not in anything I can do, but bless them in you, Jesus. I pray you would be with them this week, guide everything, let them grab on to this total confidence and let them live in it this week. Let me live in it this week, Father. I need it. I need it. It's a return to faith in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your people. And God, I pray that those who are able will be able to be with us on Wednesday for a prayer meeting. And we thank you for everyone here, Lord, and online. God bless y'all. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And if you need to pray longer, just take your time. There's no rush. You can pray on your own.